Good morning, everybody. Glad to see you. The um, announcements today. So um, one of the things we really need to be aware of and focus on is you know that at 4 o'clock today, we have a celebration of life service for Milton. And if you're able to be here, we would greatly appreciate that. And all that we can do uh, to support the family. Also, uh, after services this morning, uh, we're going to practice some of the songs. Some of them are, are I, I've, I've heard but haven't sung much. So just to get the opportunity to work on those a little bit, if you can spend just a few moments after the close, we'll, we'll practice those and get an opportunity to become more familiar. Other announcements, um, we still, of course, we all know, people that are dealing with the COVID virus still. Um, however, for those that for those that we have on our uh, in in the announcements, there's been improvements made. So we're grateful for that. We need to continue to um, pray for them, but we're we're happy that there can be some good news as well. Also, sympathies are extended to um, Jeff Moore and the recent passing of his grandmother and now his great uncle. Uh, Dale Fox has passed away, and so that's something that that they are working on and dealing with. Oscar is still awaiting the opportunity to have his back surgery uh, worked out, and so we hope that will uh, the insurance stuff will be worked out soon. Mar Mar Margaret Corbell is continuing um, her um, process of dealing with the cancers and stuff, and trying to get her blood counts back up, and so we need to pray on her behalf too. The um, the relationship Bible class that John Reese is leading started today, and there were some people here for that, so if that's something you'd like to participate in, that's an, an extra class that we've started. We hope to begin class for children starting uh, this next week. So. If you, uh, just to make sure that you're aware of that, we'll continue to have our Wednesday night Zoom uh, classes, and those will uh, continue on, and that's at, at 7 o'clock. And the children's homes needs are have been listed in a previous bulletin. If you need that, you can refer to it for the opportunities that they're, the things that they're looking for. And... Um, so if you can add that to your grocery list and bring that here, we'll store them down the hall in room 13. And when they come to pick them up, we'll, we'll have them all ready. So um, we need that. We also need another teacher if you're interested in doing that. The good news is, is the curriculum is provided as well as the children. You don't have to have your own. Um, we can have some available, made available to you. So we hope that that will work out with your schedule. And there's also some um, things that are listed about uh, parts of, of small, manageable parts of cleaning jobs that we have available. And if there's some of that that you can sign up for, I think we've divided it up pretty well. And so no one is going to be tasked with long, arduous tasks uh, in, in terms of taking care of, of the facilities and things like that. So uh, are there other announcements or anything else we need to mention this morning? Not saying anything. Let's have just a, a, a brief moment of prayer as we begin. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be here today. We thank you for the chance to be together, to offer to you our worship. We thank you for your power, for your mercy, for the grace that we have received through Christ. And help us as we seek to offer our praise to you, help us to to draw strength from one another, the encouragement that is only available through those of us in the family of faith. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity to be together. We pray that we can be an, of an encouragement to one another as we focus this day on our relationship with you. We pray all these things through Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see you. And uh, if you don't mind, I have a. I think we could all use some uh, praise scriptures, and uh, so I thought we'd start things off with uh, reading some some praise scriptures. Uh, they're from the Old Testament. They're all from Psalms. Psalm seven seventeen. I will give thanks to the Lord because of His righteousness, 
I will sing the praises of the name of the Lord Most High. Psalm 9, first verse. I will give thanks to you, Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of all your wonderful deeds. Psalm 35, verse 18. I will give you thanks in the great assembly. Among the throngs, I will praise you. Psalm 69, verse 30. I will praise God's name in song and glorify him with thanksgiving. Psalm 95, the first three verses. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. Psalm 100, verses 4 and 5. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Psalm 106, the first verse. Praise the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Psalm 107, verses 21 and 22. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. Let them sacrifice thank offerings and tell of his works with songs of joy. And Psalm 118, the first verse, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. So let's praise the Lord for the songs we have today. Let's sing that first song on your handout. My hope is built on nothing less. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest spring, but holy thing on Jesus' thing. On Christ the solid rock they stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Darkness fills his lovely face. I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is. in opening prayer. Lord God Almighty, Father in heaven, we thank you for this beautiful day, Lord. We thank you for the work that your son came to this earth, Lord, to show us the way to live in righteousness, Lord. 
and what he did for the sacrifice on the cross for us, for our sins, Lord. So we repent of our sins now, Lord, and ask you to bless us as we go. We just ask you to bless the people that are watching today and the world out there, that they get the lesson and the sermon that you're about to receive to us, Lord. We just ask that you fight this COVID for us, Lord, and have the vaccine spread around so everybody can be healthy and come back to your house, Lord. We also ask that we have a smooth transition in our power of government this, this week, Lord, so everybody can enjoy the fruits of this nation. We also give you all the glory for everything that you've ever done for us and the grace that you show us, Lord, that we can be your hands and feet and hands and just go out and show everybody the love that you emulate, Lord, forever and ever. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. The song before communion is that song that's titled When We Meet in Sweet Communion. <clears throat> when we meet in sweet gathered here to partake of the Lord's Supper, which is the focal point of uh, the first day of the week as commanded by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is a 
somber remembrance, but yet as Christians, it's, it's a, a time of joy in our lives. And as it says in uh, Isaiah, it says that uh, surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And punish, the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid it all upon him, the iniquity of us all. As we partake of this bread, we remember what Jesus said. I receive from the Lord what I also pass to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Our most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we do thank you for coming to this earth to save us from, our, from ourselves. Dora, we know that we could not pay that debt, that it was something that you had to lay down your life for, and we were sorrowful for that, but we were joyful for the fact that you have given us eternal life and that we have you to take upon, a, take upon yourself our sins and forgive us for what we have done. And as we partake of this bread, let us remember what you have done for us. In Christ's name, amen. In like manner, in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is a new covenant of my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Our most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we have the cup here that we want to partake of, which we know represents the the blood by its very color red we know that you bled and died for our sins which covers our transgressions for this we are eternally grateful but we do not want to ever forget that's why we partake of this every Sunday so that we can remember how it was what you did for us thank you dear Lord for loving us enough to do this in our, on our behalf in Christ's name we pray amen concludes the Lord's Supper. Let's sing the next song on our handout. To God be the glory. Great things he has done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son who yielded his life in atonement for sin and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. And come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory. Great things he has done. Let's sing. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his Son, who did his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus.
to see uh, the Wilsons, Milton Wilson's family members here with us today, and uh, our hearts are with you, and we'll be with you this afternoon for the celebration of his life. I do want to mention, just emphasize again, what uh, Darren mentioned in the announcements, and that is we're going back to our uh, full class schedule, class schedule, uh, we'll be aiming to cater to all age groups in the children's uh, classes, and we have two um, uh, for adults or uh, young adults as well. Uh, we have the auditorium class. John Williams is teaching on Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther, a very important series on leadership for our congregation. And uh, I am uh, leading a discussion out in the Annex uh, on life principles, those principles that help us in our decisions, the big decisions we have with regard to our lives. Uh, I do want to say, for those who might be wondering whether they ought to be there or not, that we are spaced out. It's not just from staying up late on Saturday night. It's physically distanced around so that uh, we are not, not physically close to each other, and so just feel, feel good about that. Um, last week we spoke about the new year and we liken the new year to a book with clean pages that have not been written on at all. If you haven't had a chance to look, uh, to, uh, look at that particular lesson or hear that lesson, you're welcome to, I believe it'd be online, right? It'll be recorded there so you can go back and, and check on that lesson from last Sunday. And uh, we talked about the kind of writing that you would like to do in 2021 on your book. Today what we emphasize, want to emphasize, is that you get just one book on which to write. Now you can have all sorts of choices about what goes into the book, but you just get one book, and that's a way of saying you have just one life. And the, li uh, the title of this lesson today is called The Best Life which I think is very appropriate since we will be celebrating uh, somebody who lived the best life, Milton Wilson, later on at 4 p.m. today. You have but one life to live. You have but one soul to save or to lose. Uh, and there is one, according to Jesus, just one narrow way uh, to eternal life. Since your one life and your one soul and that one way are so unspeakably precious, you want to find for yourself and for your loved ones that life which God intends, which he purposed for you. We're looking for that life that is not wasted, that is not frustrated, that is not left disappointed either now or at the end of life. The best life is that life which is truly worthwhile and purposeful and meaningful and fulfilling uh, not seemingly so to be sadly disappointed later, but really 
satisfying all the way through into eternity itself. This morning I ask you, have you thought very much about that subject? Uh, When you will have finished this life and spent the very last one of your days and weeks and minutes, hours and minutes, will you have, what will you have really accomplished of lasting value? Would you look back on it with satisfaction or would you look back with, with regret and perhaps even grief? As I said, this afternoon we'll be celebrating the life of Milton and in many ways he exemplifies that abundant life that, that Jesus gives. The de- time to determine the answers for the questions we're asking today is, is right now. The past is already gone. The future is not yet ours. This is the time that we have. There are many ways to look at life. There's many possible things you could write in your book. And a number of those leave us uh, feeling distinctly as if life is insignificant here on earth. Uh, If you look at it from the angle of uh, of material things, uh, the scientists would tell us that a man his body, that is, if it's reduced to its chemical, essential chemical properties, contains enough sulfur to rid one dog of its fleas, enough fat for six bars of soap, depends, I'm sure, on your diet, enough phosphate for 20 boxes of matches, enough potassium for a few bangs in a cap gun, enough lime to whitewash one chicken coop, enough iron for a six-penny nail, enough sugar to sweeten 10 cups of tea, and enough water to fill one bathtub. And depending on the markets, uh, that says you're really not worth a whole lot. (laughs) Uh, And, you know, the, the Bible has that aspect to it. Psalm 103 and verse 14 says, God knows our frame. He remembers that we are but dust. After the sin... In Eden, God said to the man, you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Chemically speaking, man is insignificant. We can look at it from the point of view, as we did in our discussion class this morning out in the annex, and look at it from the angle of space and the universe. Uh, David in Psalm 8 said, when I look at the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have created, What is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? If you've ever been, uh, and I assume most of us have been, in an airplane and you've looked down on uh, the little lights down there of the towns here in Texas as you flew over, or in the daytime you might have seen them if there weren't too many clouds. I remember the first time that I flew uh, uh, commercially or at least on an international flight uh, I was a young man, left Africa, was flying to the United States, happened to be flying through Paris. And I had never in my life had that perspective. So flying, coming into Paris in the morning uh, as a perfectly clear day, it was like a toy city down there. There was the River Seine and all those tiny, tiny little houses and, and, and those cars weaving along the, the streets. Uh, it, it was just an amazing sight for me the first time I'd ever seen, seen it many times, that kind of thing, many times since then. But it just blew me away at the time and, and reminded me really of my smallness. If you've traveled uh, across Texas much, you've been impressed by the immensity of our state. I remember a, a story about a Texan boasting and saying, I, I drove two whole days and I was still in Texas. And the man from Oklahoma said, yeah, I've had a car like that once too. <laughs> but you think about the size of Texas and you think about the fact that it's just one of many more states and the USA is just one country among many countries in the world and, and the size of all of that, for, from our perspective anyway. You know, uh, I come from Africa and uh, uh, Africa, and I'm not boasting here, but just to tell you, Africa, uh, you could fit 14 USAs in Africa, 14. Um, And of course, you know, as we discussed with the young people, uh, they have done these kind of models of the planets. Uh, Our Earth is really a minor planet in our solar system. 
The, the sun alone is 334,000 times larger than the Earth. And the sun is a minor star in our galaxy, and, and it's just one of, uh, of several trillion galaxies. Our, our Milky Way is just one of several trillion galaxies. And, uh, and so, yet so large is our galaxy that uh, it contains something like a hundred billion stars. And the distances between the galaxies is just something we cannot comprehend. Just to put it in terms we might try to understand, let's say that you were in a, an airplane that could go out into space and a, a, a speed that we might understand. I don't understand light years, okay? So let's just say 600 miles an hour. Do you know how long it would take for us to reach using that kind of a plane, 600 miles an hour, how long it would take to reach the nearest star? It would take a million years at that speed. So if we describe man as a mere ant on the face of the earth, we'd be grossly exaggerating. If we, we, if we said we were a speck, a piece of dust, we'd still be exaggerating. We'd have to go down to the smallest um, uh, electron or something like that, that that we could even imagine in terms of our size in the universe. In terms of time and eternity, man's span of life is also just extremely insignificant. Hundreds of generations have gone before us. If the Lord wills, there will be many more after us. Compared with all the generations that have gone before us and compared with the age of the earth itself, we're just, we're just that, a snap of a finger. Compared with eternity, it's not even, the, the, the comparisons end altogether there because there is no time in eternity. It's, it's unending. If you look at the uh, night sky sometime, out of the corner of your eye, you might have seen a star falling. It's just a, a momentary thing and you think, did I see that? And that's our life. That's exactly what our life is. Job said, my days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle. Now, in our day, we would probably say, uh, James would probably say something like, uh, our day is swifter than the turn of a piston. Uh, they come to an end, Job said, without hope, meaning without hope of furtherance. Remember that my life, Job said, is, is a mere breath. My days are swifter than a runner. They flee away. They go by like, by like an angel swooping down on the prey. That's the extent of my life. Moses said the years of our lives are 70, and that's what I am this year. Or, if by reason of strength, 80, and yet their span is but toil and trouble, and they are soon gone, and we fly away. James said, what is your life? You are a mist that appears for a short while and then vanishes. One version of Psalm 39 puts it this way. You, O oh God, have made my life no longer than no for, no wider, no longer than the width of my hand. My entire lifetime is just a moment. Now the Hebrew actually says, "is as nothing in your sight, God." Uh, each of us, he says, is a mere breath. Looking at the evidence so far, we'd have to say that uh, we are a triviality. Chemically, we are almost worthless. Within the vast expanse of the universe, we're unnoticeable. In comparison with time and eternity, we're momentary. And that all adds up to a picture of insignificance. But is that all there is? Are we no more significant than a clod of uh, dirt, a fly on a wall, or a wilting plant? Were we born merely to die? to spend a few weary, trouble-torn years in a forgotten corner of the universe only to disappear into oblivion forever? Is that the mindless futility for which you men labor at your jobs day after day, merely to me feed these machines, which is what our body is, uh, that comes to a grinding halt almost about the time it started to function right? Uh, are our joys and our tears, our loves and our smiles no more than the echoes of a very bad performance in an empty theater. And unfortunately, a lot of the world thinks that the answer is yes to those questions. That's what it is. There is no real meaning. Uh, if uh, they look at the facts uh, of science, such as the chemistry that we just uh, talked about, and they conclude that the, the best life you could possibly hope for is an empty life. 
And the materialist would say we've evolved from matter by evolutionary chance and that all we are is an accident on its, last, on its way to its last accident. The uh, philosopher Bertrand Russell said, man is but the outcome of accidental collocations, which means combinations, of at atoms. He said, you're an accident. Many people feel this way, having been influenced by philosophies and teachings they may not have fully an analyzed. Robert Ingersoll was a very famous orator of the 19th century. And when it came time to do the eulogy at his brother's grave, this was his speech. Life is a narrow veil, or valley, between the cold and barren peaks of two eternities. We strive in vain to look beyond the heights. We cry aloud, and the only answer is the echo of a wailing cry. Edward Gibbon spent much of his life uh, researching and writing history books, and he concluded with one sentence, that history is little more than the register of the crimes, follies, and misfortunes of mankind. Oswald Spengler wrote, mankind has no aim, no idea, no plan, any more than a family of butterflies or orchids. Speaking of the death that each person must experience, Mark Twain, our famous author, said, death comes at last to them, the only unpoisoned gift Earth ever had for them, and they vanish from a world where they're of no consequence, where they achieve nothing, where they're a mistake and a failure and a foolishness. Whether we ever really care to, put it, uh, care to put it in eloquent terms like that, a lot of people think that life is meaningless because they're looking at the surface level, the science, what science can observe. And yes, uh, there's not much to look forward to beyond this life. Some look at the life they have and they say, well, pleasure is really what it's all about. They don't, don't ask, is it right? They ask, is it fun? And millions of people are as 2 Timothy 3, 4 says, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. And yet, pleasure is so fleeting, uh, especially when pursued illicitly, it actually ends up bringing displeasure. Pleasure and prestige are the appeals of the ads. You think about, just as an example, the ads for alcohol. What are they basically selling you? Well, they're selling you uh, Pleasure, taste, uh, maybe getting up a little higher in society, looking, looking like you're more sophisticated than you are. Um, romance, maybe, far off places and high society. Uh, but somehow those ads just don't tell you about um, addiction and pain and uh, the shame that, that goes along with it. Alcohol is known scientifically as a narcotic drug, which even in small doses affects your brain cells, actually kills brain cells, and contributes to a third of all traffic-related accidents, uh, deaths, I should say, in the United States. Over half of the domestic abuse cases in the United States involve alcohol. There's a passage in um, uh, Proverbs, I believe it is, that says, talks about the wine going down so smoothly, but in the end it bites like a viper, and, uh, and that's the Bible's warning. And so uh, for many people, that, that is their philosophy. Eat, drink, and be merry. We talked about the rich man last time. That was his philosophy. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. And uh, the Bible speaks of those whose God is their belly, those who follow their own lusts. And even Christians in Luke chapter 8, verse 14, Christians who... Uh, started out well, but who fall because they are choked with the pleasures of this life. Now, we're not suggesting the person shall, wouldn't, shouldn't be happy. What we're saying is that pleasure is not the main aim of life, and especially if it's pursued illicitly, it will bring unhappiness. And then there is a large segment of society uh, that really believes that wealth is what it's all about. Uh, how you do financially, working for money and the things that money can buy. Uh, now, they may not say it that that's the reason, but if you just watch their behavior, what they invest in, what they invest time in, what they invest life in, uh, so much of it has to do with that. But the problem is it just never is quite satisfying. Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verse 10, Solomon said, He who loves silver shall not be satisfied with silver, nor he who loves abundance with increase, this also is vanity. He also says, as your money increases, your bills increase. Uh, that's my version of <laughs> what he said. 
What's so surprising is that we want more and more, even though we actually are some of the richest people on earth. If you were to do a survey of, uh, of, of world economies, I think you would find that as much as we complain, we are really well off. 71%, this is just figures I looked up recently, 71% of the Earth's population earns less than $10 a day. The BBC says that more than a third of the world's population lives on less than $2 a day. I think that virtually every wage earner here is probably, and I can't be categorical here, but I think probably in the top 5% of the world's earning uh, group. Um, and so, are we satisfied with that? You know, it seems that the richer we get, the less satisfied we are. Uh, why do we, the rich, pursue what Jesus categorically stated as making it more difficult to enter the kingdom of heaven? Jesus said in Matthew 19, Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And another warning that the Bible gives is the fact that desiring to be rich, see the poor can desire to be rich just as much as the rich can desire to be rich. And just the desire to be rich itself is warned against. This is in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. Those who desire to be rich, uh, how would you define the American dream? Well, this may be it, but this is what it says. Those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. In our pursuit of wealth, our family life is often what's pushed aside. It matters not, as long as I am pursuing that goal, it matters not that I'm a stranger to my family, that my marriage has lost its life and love, and most of all, I'm a stranger to God. The rich often number among the world's most miserable people. Richness cannot, wealth cannot prepare you for eternity, and it cannot lead your children in the path of wisdom and of life. The person who makes his work or his, his makes his work his success and his material comfort his aim in life is a walking tragedy waiting to happen. Some people uh, have made popularity their goal in life, to be well thought of by their friends and buddies, the girl with the most boyfriends, the boy with the most girlfriends, the life of the party person that everybody likes. If popularity is what it's all about, then Jesus got it wrong because he stuck by his principles and they crucified him for it. He made many enemies for the truth. For some, power is the prize to be able to control and manipulate, to be able to direct and dominate. Of course, the worst example of that is Hitler. And how did he end? You can look that up. Every great person who ever attained power has died. And many of them died in disillusionment, suspicion, and loneliness. And so, uh, before we get too depressed here, is that all there is? Are those five options all that are open to us? The total purposelessness of the skeptic, the shimmering fleeting illusions of the pleasure seeker, the insecure and temporary idol of the money maker, the fickleness and capriciousness of popularity, and the dubious distinctions of power. Is that all there is left for us? Can you imagine a man who spends weeks and months building a beautiful sailing craft, a yacht, preparing for a once-in-a-lifetime race. And then the day of the race comes, but he never looks at the charts. He never sets the sail. He never takes hold of the tiller to give the rudder its direction. He just drifts at the mercy of wind and current. We would say that man is absolutely crazy. And yet how many people have one life and they're just drifting with whatever the latest fad happens to be, whatever their parents happen to say, whatever their peers happen to say, and wasting the one life that they have. 
Solomon, by God's inspiration, said, The end of the matter all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. The original Hebrew there doesn't actually have the word duty. It says, serving God is the whole of man. If you're not in a relationship with your God, if you're not serving God and keeping his commandments, you're not a whole person. Because God didn't intend you that way, never made you to be that way. There's a big hole in your life. Augustine put it this way, speaking to God, he says, You have made us for yourself, and our heart is restless until it finds rest in you. The hole in our hearts is God-shaped, and he is the only one who can fill it. God is our maker, and he made us for a purpose, that purpose being to serve and to love and to obey him, and ultimately by this path of grace to live eternally with him. And when we divorce ourselves from our maker and from his purpose, then we are futile. That's all that can be said about it. In fact, the book of Ecclesiastes says that well. Romans chapter 1, verses 21 and 22, they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened, claiming to be wise, they became fools. What good is a man, uh, what good is a car that never runs? What good is a surgeon who never operates? And what good is a man who spends his life in trivialities effectively ignoring his divine maker and his divine purpose? And so if I were to go to a city that I didn't know very well, I would take along my GPS. In the old days, I'd take along my map. And I'd see, fig figure out where I'm going. I'd, I'd, uh, I know without those, I would definitely be lost. There are thousands of potential roads you can take in life. But Jesus very categorically said in Matthew chapter 7, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter it by it are many, for the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Jesus said, The way is narrow. That was singular. There's only one way. When you're looking for the best life, there's only one that qualifies. That's the one with a small gate, and a narrow way. And because of that fact, there are those uh, who, who take it are few. Have you found the small gate? Uh, the world, including the religious world, will offer you all sorts of gates, but Jesus says there's just one, and it's small. It involves trusting in Jesus with all of your heart, believing that you have a purpose, believing in his love for you, whatever may happen in life, believing his sacrifice to free you of your sins, believing that his resurrection gives you new life. It involves repenting and turning away from our own way and choosing God's way. It involves immersion in water. And if you doubt that that's part of the small gate, that narrow gate, then read Romans chapter 6, where it talks about the fact that we're baptized into Christ, baptized into his death to start in order that we may start that new life. There's only, and that of course is just the beginning. Jesus said, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. John chapter 10, verse 10. Rich, fulfilling, overflowing. That is the life that Jesus gives, abundant life. But to receive it, you first have to give it back to Jesus. Put it into his hands to shape and to control and to mold. For whoever would save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. You must relinquish control and hand over the wheel to Jesus. So don't waste the one life that you have. Don't waste the one eternal soul that God gives you. Don't waste the love and the purpose that God has invested in you. The power of choice is yours and yours alone, but that choice is only for a while. Choose the best life for yourself and choose it as the influence for your loved ones. Choose the abundant life that Jesus paid so, such a high price to give you. 
you want to give your life to Christ or to give it again, then please do that now. Please talk to one of us whom, who can help you and let, let us know what your needs are and help us to be of help to you. Part of our purpose is being family together. Let's have our, our closing song, or at least the song after the lesson. Our next song will be Sing and Be Happy. If the skies above you are gray, you are beaten to blue. If your cares and burdens are gray, all day through, there's a silver lining that shines in the heavenly land. Look by faith and see it, my friend. Trust in his promises, friend. Sing and be happy. Press on to the goal. Trust him. Truly, to he will keep your soul. Let all be faithful. Look to him and pray. Lift your voice and praise him in song. Sing and be happy today. Often we are troubled and tired, sick with sorrow and pain. There are others living in sin, blessed with earthly gain. Take you courage, we cannot tell what the morrow may bring. When the dark clouds vanish away, then your heart truly can sing. Sing and be happy, press on to the goal. Trust Him who leads you, He will keep your soul. Let all be faithful, look to and pray, lift your voice and praise him in song, sing and be happy today. Oft we fail to see the rainbow up in heaven's gray sky, when it seems the fortunes of earth crown and pass us by. There are things we know that are worth more than silver and gold. If we hope and trust in each day, we shall have pleasure untold. Sing and be happy, press on to the gold. Trust in Him who leads you, He will. Keep your soul, let the be faithful, look to him and pray. Lift your voice and praise him in song. Sing and be happy today. Let's sing one last song. That's Steadfast Love the Lord. Back, back song on the, on the back sheet of your handout. After that, we'll have a closing prayer. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion. As my soul, therefore I will hold in view. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases, His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness.
bless you. Let's have a quick word of prayer. Father God, thank you so much for being with us during this hour of worship. Be with us as we go forth in our what we need to do this, this coming week. And let us feel the touch of your, your love and that your presence, that you know that you are with us moment by moment in everything that we do. We pray all these things in your son's wonderful name. Amen.